This is the Capital Markets. Good evening and welcome to the program. I'm Edith Yongiwang. The capital market serves various purposes to the country. Principal among these is the facilitation of free flow of short and long-term equity and debt capital to corporations and governments that use it to carry out capital-intensive projects that subsequently enhances the economy. In view of these, it is important that a capital market is efficient in its structure and operation so as to attract investors. The market is governed by laws which bring fairness to transactions and ensure adequate due diligence is carried out on all parties. On the show tonight, we turn our focus to the legal intrigue cases of the capital market, and I'm being joined by Chidi Eber Odomina, an associate at Aluko and Oyebode. Good evening, Chidi. Thank you for coming on the program. Thank you for having me on the program. So I would just like to ask, how has the COVID-19 um, pandemic affected capital market lawyers? Um, so it's affecting us, the only thing is affecting them, other market participants. Mm -hmm. um, their positive impact, their negative impact. Um, but I think um, from a client demand perspective, we are seeing more demand um, from clients for debt types work. You know, so we are seeing more demand um, for bond insurances and commercial paper insurances. Uh, where some issuers are prepared to go to market now, others may be willing to establish programs and watch the market for signs of stability. We're also seeing some movement in terms of um, liability management type work. So issuers that have um, existing issuances in the market may come to us and try to restructure their existing issuances. Um, things are a bit slow on the equity side. Okay. Uh, things have been slow on the equity side even mm -hmm. before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. But when you have IPOs or listings by introduction in the works, uh, these transactions have been put on hold you know, people wait for market to stabilize. Um, similar to the equity capital markets, the market for collective investment schemes, mutual funds, your rates, uh, things have also slowed down in that, uh, in that aspect as well. Uh, it's also changing how we work. Okay. Uh, to now we have to take some things into consideration when advising our clients. Uh, now we have to consider uh, putting clauses for e-signatures in our agreements. We have to look closely at our first major clauses. We have to consider a possible um, disruption to payment timelines in our agreement. So I will see in terms of impact, um, positive and, and negative. Okay, so definitely we all know that the COVID-19 has brought changes not only to government and economies, but how, what role will um, lawyers play in navigating through these changes going forward? Uh, so lawyers will play a very critical role, if you ask me, uh, because um, first, most people come into markets there during this period, most companies come into market during this period, um, are first-timers, uh, most of them are debutants. So they will need lawyers to hold their hands to guide them through the process. Uh, nobody has uh, issued securities in the market during the pandemic, at least in recent years. Uh, so people are very new to this thing, if you ask me. Uh, so you want uh, issuers coming to market, they need to, they need to be, uh, you know, they need to be clear, they need to be sure about what they are signing in terms of agreement. And not just issuers, even issuing houses, trustees. So everyone needs a lawyer during this period to guide them through the process, you know, to point out, uh, you know, possible issues that may arise in terms of documents they sign, in terms of uh, the issuance structures in the market during this period. Okay, so companies had no choice but to implement work from home policies. Now, of course, one of the roles of the capital market lawyer is to carry out due diligence. How has the process been so far and how will that change? you know, going forward? So in terms of due diligence, uh, not a lot has changed, really. Okay. And we will conduct the uh, due diligence uh, because most companies that come to market are sophisticated companies. So we are typically used to, you know, getting them to put documents on data rooms or cloud software or maybe just send the documents to us through emails. Uh, so we don't necessarily have to go into client offices to, you know, do due diligence. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say that the, the, the main aspect we will have issues with in terms of you know doing virtual due diligence, is when you are dealing with a company that has you know bulk litigation, uh, so it's very difficult for them to upload the uh, litigation files on cloud software. Uh, so before the pandemic, we had to go into client offices to sit down and go through their uh, litigation files, and really during this period as well, what we what we've done is you know either try and get them to you know scan these documents to to cloud platforms. Or we can set up physical data rooms where you can send maybe one or two lawyers uh, going to, cry, to client offices, sit down and see how we can do due diligence. Uh, it will take more time than usual than what we are used to, mm -hmm. uh, but ultimately we'll get the job done. 
Okay, so transparency in the capital market is a necessity for investors. And in trying to protect investors, the Securities and Exchange Commission um, stressed the need for regulated entities to make adequate disclosures on the impact of COVID-19 on their businesses. Now, these are very uncertain times, so issuers may not exactly be able to give full disclosure of the impact. What um, provision is, do they have in the law? And then like, what's the provision for the law in situations like this? So the law is clear, really, on disclosure. Okay. So if an issuer is going to go to market, an uh, issuer has to disclose information on any and everything that can affect the issuer's financial condition during the time the securities are issued. Okay. Uh, and you've seen the SEC come out to emphasize that uh, that sort of information would include information on how the pandemic would affect the issuer's business. Mm -hmm. uh, what the law doesn't exactly envisage is this exact type and of then, scenario, yes. really. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, what we do and what uh, my firm has advised on really during this period is, first, uh, when you're doing your prospectus, you have a caveat uh, we call it a um, forward-looking statement. Okay. So it's sort of you putting some warning out to your investors that some information I'm going to provide in these documents are uh, indicative. These are, you know, this is probably a forecast to the investors. Things may change in the next two months or three months. So note that information in this document uh, have been provided as a forecast. Okay. So that sort of protects the investor and protects the issuer as well. But I agree with you that it may be difficult to you know, give a proper forecast yeah. on how things may play out uh, in the next couple of months or, you know, even a Q1, Q2 2021. Okay. But then, like, still on that, I mean, if a company cannot exactly, you know, like we said, it's going to be difficult to know the impact, you know, the exact impact, would there be any sanctions Give it, like with the laws that we have now, or would there be an excuse? Or okay, because this is not the law hasn't really envisaged this pandemic before to have regulations around that. What happens then? Yeah. Would there be would there be like an exemption in cases like that? So typically, and I'll give an example of a deal that okay. I just closed um, a couple of uh, a couple of days back. Mm -hmm. uh, so we had that issue really, and you know what do you do as an issuer? You know you put as much information as you can put. Okay. Then when you go to the regulator, uh, you discuss with the regulator, uh, you know, especially if you're dealing with an SEC or if you're dealing with an exchange like the FMDQ, you, know, you engage them, you put what you can put, what you think information that you have at this time, uh, talk to them, and then you know, see what you can work out just to make sure there's a, there's a balance between okay. information going to the investors and just make sure that you as an issuer, you're not providing false information as well. Okay, so are there any problems associated with the legal provisions governing the Nigerian capital markets and to what extent are the legal frameworks and enforcement produce procedures of the Nigerian capital market effective as compared to those in developed markets? Uh, so I think to answer that question, I would, I would elect to you know, look at where we were okay. a couple of years back and where we are now in terms of uh, regulation. Mm -hmm. And honestly, uh, if you look at the capital markets master plan, issued by the SEC in 2015, you see that uh, you know, we've done a very good job. You know, mm -hmm. we've you know, we actually uh, you know, come a long way. Uh, and I would say really, in terms of what we can do better, in terms of regulation, I would say first, uh, if we want to grow a proper market for securitization, for, for derivatives uh, uh, products to thrive, mm -hmm. then we, we, we have to look at amending some of our laws. So for example, if you want to uh, you know, create a market for mortgage-backed securities, then you should be looking at amending the provisions of the Land Use Act okay. to remove the requirement for consent of the governor for such deals. And really, uh, you know, what, when you leave such a provision in the Land Use Act, you know, what it does to those type of instruments is that it will, it will delay, you know, the amount of time, you know, it will, it will delay your process, mm -hmm. you know, uh, in trying to close such deals. And, and again, uh, you know, going back to your question again, really, if you want to, uh, if you want to, you know, properly, you know, create a proper market as well for other type of products, then we should be looking at amending, you know, some of our laws. And if you look at the fact that most people that invest in the market are PFAs, then maybe we should be looking at uh, amending the provisions of the Pension Reform Act, mm -hmm. you know, to increase the threshold of funds under management they can yeah. invest uh, in the capital market, you know, the bond market, for example. And then, uh, you know, really, in, in my view, I would say, 
amend some of our existing laws, and then you know we can we can watch it play out, and you will see that when you do uh, law amendments, uh, it will really help the market. Okay, so do you think the current um, current capital market laws are sufficient to attract investment activity in real estate? So for real estate, I would also look at it from the context of the capital markets master plan, okay. and you will see that um, we are doing a good job in terms of you know how we regulate fund formation for REITs, how we regulate issuance of units for REITs. Um, you know, you would really see that. Uh, we have sufficient uh, regulation in that aspect. The main aspect where we had issues with was in terms of taxation. So we had issues with double taxation for REITs. And I think what that did for investors was that you know, it sort of discouraged them from coming to play uh, in that sector. Uh, but the Finance Act, which was just passed recently, um, a couple of months back, has really uh, you know, solved uh, most mm -hmm. of that problem. And what you will see now is that there's a tax exemption for rental income mm -hmm. um, earned by REITs. There's a tax exemption for dividend income earned by re uh, REITs when they invest in SPVs. So I would say, maybe when the market stabilizes after the pandemic, we would watch and see uh, if those tax incentives will help us. But again, going back to your question, I would say that uh, our laws are sufficient from an SEC angle. Okay. And now that we have proper tax laws for REITs, uh, I'm very hopeful I that, we'll that things will get better. Okay, so in March, the Senate passed the Companies and Allied Matters Amendment Act to promote financial stability. Now, what do you make of this from a legal standpoint? I think the Common Bill is a step in the right direction, okay. if you ask me. And this is when you put it in context of the work uh, the PEBEC mm -hmm. has been doing. Uh, you will see that uh, there's actually intent you know, from the part of the government to promote uh, you know, stability, uh, you know, to promote small businesses, and let me give you an example. We've been talking about trying to build a market for over-the-counter derivatives. And one of the biggest issues we faced from the context, again, of stability is, you know, that we had, you know, uh, you had very serious credit risk involved in those type of uh, transactions. And the fact that we did not have any netting provisions, you know, sort of hampered the growth of that, uh, of that industry. Mm -hmm. So now you have the Kama Bill introducing a close-out netting provision which will help mitigate credit risk and which I think will boost uh, uh, stability. And then going back again, uh, if you look at the law, you will see actual intent to promote small businesses and SMEs. Uh, the law re uh, reduces the burden on them in terms of regulation. You know, the amount of filing they're supposed to do, uh, you know, the amount of maybe probably getting an audit, for example. Uh, so what that, what that does is that it allows these businesses to, you know, to focus more, to channel funds into expansion, into growing their business instead of uh, regulation. And I think that would help us in terms of financial stability, uh, like you asked. Okay, so the DMO had an offering for a 150 billion naira Sukuk bond, which closed on June the 2nd. Now, the market wasn't advised on allotments for over a week. What is the position of the law on this? And are there rules guiding this? So when you say advice on mm -hmm. allotments, I, I assume that what you mean is the issuer, the issuing, uh, issuing an allotment confirmation notice, sort yes. of, you know, giving the, the bidder information about whether or not their bid mm -hmm. has been accepted yes. and, you know, if their bid has been accepted, you know, how much bonds have been allotted to them. Uh, so what the law says really on that aspect is that the law regulates the earliest possible time within which uh, the issuer can issue that notice. That's okay. three days after which you've issued your prospectus. Okay. The law doesn't regulate the latest possible time within okay. which you can you know, issue that notice. Okay. Um, the law leaves that for the issuer to decide in the prospectus. And if you open a prospectus, you will see um, an indicative timetable mm -hmm. in the prospectus where okay. the issuer will sort of you know, provide uh, you know, the items, okay. you know, the sequence of items on you know, how it would uh, you know, progress with the issuance. Uh, typically, you may see a one-week period. You can see you can see five-day period. Um, so, but again, the issuer provides a caveat, okay. a rider at the end of that timetable that uh, investor look. Uh, this timeline here are indicative. Things may change. Okay, please hold your thoughts on that. We'll continue this conversation when we return in a moment. Stay with us.
Welcome back and thanks for staying with us on the program. Chide Ebere Odoyemenam, a capital markets lawyer and an associate at Aluko and Oyebode, I beg your pardon, is still with us on the program. So Chidi, as we're talking about, you know, allotments, when allotments are not communicated on the day that they're supposed to be announced, are there sanctions or recourse? Like what sanctions or recourse do market participants have? Uh, so you have that... Um there's a penalty in the SEC rules, okay. um, but that is for when you, when you advise the market, like you said, when you advise your bidders earlier than you're supposed to do that. Okay. But because the law doesn't um, regulate the latest possible time within mm -hmm. which you can advise, okay. uh, it leaves that for you to decide in your timetable, in your prospectus. Okay. The law doesn't uh, you know, penalize that. And like I said, uh, because the, the issuer communicates the rider, mm -hmm. the the caveat to okay. investors that the timetable is indicative and things may change. Okay. Uh, I would say that, you know, really there's no penalty. But going back to that DMO issuance again, mm -hmm. the DMO issuance uh, was a very large issuance. Okay. It was sold to retail investors. Uh, so in practice, and looking at it from a very practical standpoint now, uh, is that uh, it may be difficult for them, you know, getting back to everyone, you know, within, like you mentioned, a one-week period, right? Yeah. Uh, so I would assume that that was the problem. And typically these issues that are resolved amicably between issuer, issuing houses, uh, and all market participants. Okay, but in, in a situation where an investor does not make good his bid because there was no communication, so let's say the time frame is one week and then he passes one week and there's no communication and then an investor doesn't make good his bid, can the investor be held liable? So when you, when you say held liable, I, I imagine you mean um, uh, really can... Can you say that the investor has breached maybe you know, making yes. a payment or funding? Yes. And really, I think the sequence of things is that first you advise the mm -hmm. investor okay. on whether or not their bid was even successful, okay. and you know whether they got you know uh, you know how much bonds they bid for. Okay. Then the sequence again is that the the, the investor now pays. So you can't expect me as an investor, for example, to pay if I don't know what I'm paying for. Okay. So when you say can the investor be held liable? Really, you can't, you can't expect the investor to pay, to make a payment or to fund. Uh, so I will answer your question and say, no, you can't hold the investor liable okay. until the issuer advises the investor. Okay, no, so, but what I'm, what I'm trying to understand is, so let's say I make a bid now and I haven't, and it's successful, but I do not know it's successful. Mm -hmm. So are you saying that if it passes a week and then eventually, I'm now told that the bid was successful, but then I've decided to move on. I will not be held liable. Uh, so because the timeline, okay. the prospectus is indicative again. Okay. Remember I said it's indicative. Yes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, because uh, the investor already knows that things may change, uh, I will say that uh, the law doesn't exactly envisage this type of scenario again. You know, really. Uh, so holding the investor liable, you know, coming back to the investor and say pay, I think from a more practical standpoint, I would really want to know, you know, how long, you know, the time lapse between when the bid was submitted and when the, the issuer uh, got back to the investor. That would really determine whether or not you can ask the investor to pay. If you don't get back to me as a mm -hmm. bidder after two months, okay. you know, I can tell you that I've, 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 I've probably put my money to, to other like, users yeah. as well. Okay. So in the event that I corporate or the government comes to the market to raise an amount of money and then it's oversubscribed. What's the maximum they can take? We know that for, like, if you don't get up to 50% of applications, the issue is cancelled. But for bonds, what's the max that can be taken if it's oversubscribed? So in the rules, is a green shoe option. We call it a green shoe option. That's the option for you to take um, oversubscribed amounts. Okay. Um, that amount for bonds is 15%. Okay. For okay. bonds, yes. Okay. Because we just wanted to clarify that because we know for equities, you can take like 25%. Okay. But what possible reforms do you think are needed to enhance investor confidence and make the market more efficient? Well, thank you for that very important question, um, Edith Young, again. Mm -hmm. uh, so in terms of you know, boosting investor confidence and uh, market efficiency, like you mentioned, um, I would say again, for investor confidence, I think the first thing we can do is you know, channel more efforts into investor education. Uh, and I know the SEC, the NSC, the FMDQ, and the CBN are already doing, uh, you know, they, they already have initiatives in this, mm -hmm. uh, in this aspect. But I think, you know, we may need more synergy from all our regulators. Mm -hmm. 
I think that they may need to work together with the National Orientation Agency, you know, to see how we can, you know, do more in terms of educating people on the gains in, you know, investing in the capital markets. Because honestly, between me and you, many people don't know much about the capital market. True, true. And um, again, you know, in terms of investor confidence, again, I would say regulator follow the demand and regulate the demand. So if you see more people investing in farm crowding platforms, for example, regulate that space, make that product safe for them. And I've seen the draft rules released by the SEC for crowdfunding. Okay. Uh, I think it's a step in the right direction. Uh, I think it will help us a lot. And again, going back to your question on efficiency, mm -hmm. I would say that uh, if you follow the very healthy competition between the FMDQ and the NSC, you will see how that is helping us in terms of efficiency. You know, we're seeing a slightly more, uh, you know, a slightly more efficient market, you know, in terms of structure. We are seeing the FMDQ you know, just launch its own um, uh, depository mm -hmm. recently uh, as well. And I think that when the NSC, um, when the NSC uh, uh, deal is done, you know, you see a more, you know, organized NSC. You see a more, uh, you know, a more organized NSC, I say, mm -hmm. demutualized. Okay. And lastly, in terms of efficiency, I would say uh, the use of tech, the use of IT is going to be very crucial mm -hmm. uh, in terms of any plans we have for market efficiency. And if you see what happened uh, when tech was introduced for the brokers, you know, if, if you see how that helped them in terms of, you know, uh, you know making uh, you know, their work faster, I think that if we can deploy tech uh, in a much more larger scale in the market, we're going to see a much more efficient capital market. All right. Chidi Odoemenam is an associate at Aluko and, and Oyo Bode. Chidi, thank you for coming on the program. Thank you for having me. So let's do a quick market review. Sentiment remained weak in the domestic equities market as the all share index declined by 0.12% week on week to 24,306.36 points. The exchange witnessed two sessions of losses in all five trading sessions as substantial profit-taking activities on bellwether stocks dragged market performance, bringing the month-to-date and year-to-date losses to minus 0.7% and minus 9.4% respectively. Volume of deals traded this week were lower compared to the previous session as 901.54 million shares worth 13.45 billion naira changed hands in over 18,600 deals. Sectoral performance were negative as all counters declined apart from the banking index, which surged 5.85%. Consumer goods recorded the biggest loss of 3.69%, followed by the industrial goods, which shared 2.13%. Insurance declined 0.73% and oil and gas lost 0.67%. The NSD OTC market also closed the week on a negative note with the NSI shedding 1.28% to 707.77 points and the market cap fell to 526.65 billion naira. Volume traded for the week stood at 10.737 million units worth 59.82 million naira and all that was traded in 36 deals. Moving to the fixed income market, activity in the bond market was relatively subdued this week. We make sentiment seen across board as market participants anticipated the release of the bond issuance calendar for the third quarter. Pockets of demand were seen across board, particularly on short tenor maturities, although on a less aggressive note. In all, yields declined by 16 basis points week on week. The Treasury bills market started the week on a relatively quiet note with minimal activity witnessed across board due to unattractive Nigerian Treasury bills yields. Activity in that space maintained its relatively weak trend for the rest of the week on, limited, on the back of limited market supply. Well, that's all on the program tonight. Thank you for watching. I'm Edidion Iwang. Do remember to stay safe.